Are these solderless breadboards as good as garbage or can you actually do real prototyping with one? Let's break out the network analyzer and find out and then we'll draw today's wave winners. Conventional internet wisdom tells us that you shouldn't use a breadboard for signals over 10 megahertz. Is that true? Where did that frequency limit come from? I couldn't find any answers I liked, so today we're actually gonna quantify the performance of a breadboard. They get a bad rap, but they're fantastically helpful for hands-on work, especially if you're playing around with a new component or prototyping a simple build. If you're like me though, I'm always worried the schematic won't transfer well to an actual PCB. Let's see if 10 megahertz is actually the maximum a breadboard can handle. We'll use our Fuel Fox, which goes up to 28 gigahertz, so it's safe to say we're over-equipped for this measurement. To connect it to the breadboard, we need cabling and fixtures. These fixtures are a bit sketchy, but breadboard work is suspect anyways, so it should be good enough. And you also now have a super geeky pair of earrings. So let's put the field fox into network analyzer mode, set it up for an S21 measurement, and scale our signals so we're running a sweep from 30 kilohertz up to two gigahertz. For an S21 measurement, we're going to output a frequency sweep at a known power from port one, run the signal through the device under test, and see what we get at port two. It's called an S21 measurement because it tells us what happens on port two as a result of what happens on port one. Before you can make any decent measurements with a network analyzer, you have to do a calibration. We're gonna do a quick and dirty cal, but a VNA cal is a whole deep dive topic that we don't have time for today. So here's what it looks like before calibration, and here's what it looks like after we cal with a simple coax cable attached. When we add in our fixture and short it, we can see that the screen looks different again. This is the effect of these fixtures on the measurement. This highlights the importance of both calibration and using good fixtures and cabling. Because we only want to see the breadboard's parameters, let's run another cal, but with our fixture attached. So with the cal, we've essentially compensated for our fixtures, and now it's time to measure the breadboard. We're gonna start with just one row of those five dots and nothing else. And you can see we're getting pretty good performance to right about here. Let's zoom in on it a little bit and put a marker on it. So at around 250 megahertz, our performance is pretty good, but then it drops significantly. And you can see where our marker is. We're getting about a minus six dB attenuation, which is about 50%. So if you put in one volt, you're only gonna get 500 millivolts out at that frequency. Other breadboards perform similarly. So in this scenario, you could do some pretty respectable work, even if you do need some headroom for harmonics or fast edges. However, you don't use a breadboard on only one row, you use jumper wires to build your circuit, so let's see what this baby can really do. First, let's simply add a couple jumper wires on the path, essentially just adding extra inductance and capacitance. So you can see we're still doing pretty well in that 250-ish megahertz range, but above that, things got even crazier. Next, let's move a port to a new row and patch it over using our jumper cables. So you can see that changed it up significantly, especially in our lower frequency ranges. So let's see what's going on over here. You can see at around 100 megahertz, we're getting minus three and a half dB of attenuation, which is probably in like the 0.6 to 0.7 transfer function range. So if you put in one volt, you'll get six or 700 millivolts out, which Technically, bandwidth is minus three dB or better, so we're kind of right on the brink of what's achievable here. At 20 megahertz, we're doing okay, but then we have some sort of low cut filter on here, probably some stray inductance or capacitance that drops us down significantly, and we're not getting any of those low frequency signals coming through. But overall, 30 megahertz looks pretty good. Finally, let's just go crazy with it. This is why people hate breadboards. So we can actually see some level of improvement with this tons of jumper wire setup. If you look, we're getting performance up to around 137 megahertz where that marker is. And we've also gotten back our low frequency ranges. So at 30 kilohertz, we're seeing 0.05 dB attenuation uh, positive. So it's actually a little higher than what you put in. And that's just from the inductive and capacitive components reflecting and sending back some signals in. At the end of the day, life is like a box of breadboards. It's just full of stray inductances and capacitances. 
But really, breadboards are just like every other tool and component. If you're going to use it, you have to know its limits. However, the data we saw today shows that they can't be ruled out as a useful tool in the right scenarios. In this case, between one or two megahertz up to 30 megahertz, it seems to be pretty consistent. But that 10 megahertz spec, I'm not finding that data anywhere. So do you hate breadboards? Do you love breadboards? Do you use them? Do you never use them? Let us know in the comments. Well, that was one of the silliest things I've done in a while. I'll have to save those for later. Anyways, the general consensus is that solderless breadboards work okay for medium speed, medium impedance level, and medium precision and power circuits. We only looked at bandwidth today, but there are a ton of other factors that come into play here beyond just the bandwidth. For example, how's the noise? How close can you actually get to your bypass capacitors when you're using one of these? What about EMI and crosstalk? How, how repeatable is it? I also think that just about anyone who's ever used electronics has a horror story from using these things. I'd love to hear yours in the comments. We'll also be back live on Monday for another Field Fox tip with Sarah, this time looking at a distance to fault measurement. By the way, if you missed her tip from Monday, you should go check it out. She explored whether or not a microwave can tank your Wi-Fi speed. And now it's time to draw today's winners. Since it's Friday, we'll draw five scope winners, five DMM winners, and we'll also draw our first tier one prize winner. Winners will get their choice of a N9918A 26 and a half gigahertz Field Fox, a six gigahertz DSOX 6004A oscilloscope, a P5002A nine gigahertz network analyzer, or an N6705C power analyzer. Today's scope winners of the DSLX 1204G are Fred Pacosta, Simo Ohanan, Daniel Edwards, Aaron Wenzel, and Colton Crandall. The U1282A winners are David Matthews, love your music, Siptarshi Talutgar, Warren Daniel, Atso Simochki, and Charles Tutin. Congratulations to those winners. And the winner of the tier one prize who gets their choice of all of that equipment is Chris Hack. Congratulations to all of our winners. We'll be in touch with you shortly. And that's it for today. Have a great weekend and make sure to subscribe to this channel. Check us out on the other social sites that you use. Thanks for watching. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff and I'll see you back here live on Monday. And now I'm contractually obligated to spend the remaining seconds modeling Pomona earrings. That's hilarious. Oh, you're serious. <laughs>